Good morning. My name is Elaine Appleby and I've come over from um, Keithley, which is part of Bradford District. And I have to tell you, I'm a Lancastrian as well. But as I've lived in Yorkshire now twice as long as ever I did in Lancashire, I hope that that kind of qualifies me for some, uh, for some points at least. Um, I'm really delighted to have been asked to speak today because I've been sitting at home over the last few years going, bloody hell. Here we go again, deja vu. Um, I'm an old buzzard. 35 years my working life on this very issue and asking the question, how can together we work so that communities can thrive? And um, my whole working life has been, it seems to me, about recessions. There was, as Tracy said, the 1980s recession. There was the 1991 recession, there was the 1986 uh, welfare benefit reforms, which had an impact almost as great as these. I mean, these go even further this time. Um, and there's been that, we've got a double whammy now, and we've had a double, double whammy before. And the way, the way that that, the things I've learnt over those 35 years, um, actually, when I thought about it, the main learning points happened at times of recession. And we didn't know as much as we do now, and we made things happen for the better. So we can be hopeful. And I don't think today that I'm going to say anything to you that you don't already know. I'm hoping that actually um, you, it just confirms what you know and confirms your thinking and action. I was 24. 35 years ago and i had been a psychiatric social worker all of 12 months and I began to think no this is really weird I've got all these young women on my caseload and they're coming into hospital with depression and anxiety and OCD and what in the old days they were called a nervous breakdown and they come into hospital they get straightened up and straightened out then they're given somebody like me and back they go and not much longer later, they're back again into the hospital. And I began to think that my seeing them once a fortnight wasn't really going to make much difference. So as I listened to people, I thought, you know, actually there's nothing wrong with these young, young women. I was only 24. These, you know, the women that I'm seeing, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with them. But there is something very wrong about the conditions that they're living in. No wonder they're depressed. Actually, it was a very normal reaction. And about the same time, Bradford Social Services Notice that on one of the big estates, they had a lot of children coming into care or being put on the um, abuse register, child abuse register. And so they decided to do something creative. And I got the job, along with a senior social worker called Roger Perry, to go and do something creative. And Roger and I went and worked on this big estate. It had a population of just under 10,000. It was one of the largest then council housing estates in Europe. And I'm going to talk about that in a little minute. But I just wanted to say something about poverty. During that period that I was working with communities directly on the ground, seeing what happened to working class communities when the work was taken away, because that's what happened. In 1979, when I started working on Homewood, unemployment on that estate was already 10%. And that was before the 65,000 jobs in Bradford went. And something happens when you take work out of working class. Working class culture in this country has been very, very rich. There's a, um, a couple of researchers at Nottingham University called the Newsons, and they wrote tomes about working class child rearing practice. It was a confident community in many ways. And then we got this, this massive, massive, massive change economically. And I began to watch what happened to people. And just personally, watching what happened to individuals. And I began to think about what is it that's, that's really happening here. And of course, poverty is about a lack of money. So all the work that's going on to maximise people's benefits is terrific. But there's also other stuff going on. Messages about people are now beamed into the comfort of their living rooms. That they're scroungers. That there's work there if only they get out and find it. That, you know, it's, there's no reason for them to be on benefit and that it's punitive when they do go on benefit. 
So the damage that was done to them psychologically in terms of self-esteem was massive. But there were other things as well. At the time of Mrs. Thatcher's rhetoric about choice, well, choice is fine if you've got some resources, otherwise you ain't got any. You don't choose where to live, you don't choose which school your kids go to. You can't even choose to buy yourself a decent cup of coffee. Opportunity. What's the latest headlines? Is it poor old Hull and Blackburn or Burnley? We're going to close down and move the people because we might as well give up on those towns. They'll never be work for people. People can't move. There's no resource even to move, so there's no choice about that. And when you think about it, there's not much in the way of power. And while we may not always be able to do enough to get people to have enough money, we can maximise what they can get. We can do something collectively about the rest. So there I was, 24 years old, with Roger Perry, the senior social worker, and Roger says to me, right, we're going on to this estate and we're going to do three things, he said. We're going to listen to people. What is it like to be them raising their children in this place? Then we're going to ask them their ideas to help them be even better parents. And then he said, we're going to support them take action. And I think this top thing of paying attention was probably the most powerful thing we did. And you know, I put a rocket there because this stuff is heartbreakingly not rocket science, but it has the power of rocket science when you get it right. So we did that and we felt stupid. We went to the post office and hung around when families were queuing up for the, the you know, child benefit. We hung around baby clinic. We just went to people and said, Hi, hello, I'm Elaine. And I just want to know what it's like being a parent. You know, I mean, you just felt really stupid. But some people began to gather with us and they began to share their ideas. And they came up with some terrific ideas. And we brought them together. And then between them, they began to organise. And it wasn't very long before we got a plethora of activity on this bigger estate. It had had two little play groups and this very small community association. By the time I left, eight years later, We'd under five gym club, we'd got a toy library, we'd even got a children's centre. Now I realise, of course, we were the very first sure start, probably. But there's something about that word deliberating that's really important. I'm just dwelling on this because everything I did for the next 30 years was informed by the learning from the people on Homewood. And we can ask people individually what they think about things, yes. But the real power of people's thinking is when they deliberate together. Otherwise, you just tend to get a set of prejudices. But when people listen to each other, their own thinking starts to change. And we start to mould each other's thinking. And the key thing was it moved to action very swiftly. Very unusually then, we based ourselves in the health centre. So not only did we listen and talk with local people, we actually listened and, and talked to frontline workers. Oh, well, people never come to antenatal. They never come to antenatal with the second babies. They're not interested. Oh, that's interesting. They come for the first baby, but I think then they lose interest when it comes to the second baby. So I said to the, to the pregnant woman, so, you know, this second baby bit, well, you turn up for two hours, You've got a toddler running around screaming because there's nothing for him to do. You get in there and all she does is take your blood pressure, put a dipstick in your wee, and, you know, and weigh you. And you're out, I mean, all that for five minutes because nobody had ever explained about preeclampsia. Nobody knew why they were having those checks or how important they were. So Scotland at that point came up with a fabulous uh, maternity uh, and pregnancy booklet with pictures and explanations, absolutely fantastic. And so gathering the, gathering the professionals together then um, on the estate for lunch and sharing some of this, eventually that led to a community council being set up. Local people, local professionals together on the community council and that was where the place started to take off. And it's when we combine those strengths of the whole system there, lots can be done at the very, um, very local level and I'll come back to that. By the 1990s, it was obvious that um, Bradford communities across the piece, I, I was then employed by the Church of England, we replicated 
um, the home would in, a, in an inner city part of Bradford, actually first partnership in Bradford really between the church, housing and social services. And we replicated the model of Homewood and this time it was great because we could have local people running the project, not just um, being part of it. But in the early 1990s, I was then appointed as the Bishop's Officer for Church and Society and I was being paid to pay attention to the whole. And as I looked across Bradford, I saw our communities at a very, very low ebb. So nicking an idea from Liverpool Diocese, who'd held a poverty hearing, um, I suggested that an ecumenical group I was working with, that we, we work with communities to do a two-hour presentation in four areas of the district, and we invite the great and the good, the decision makers, to come along. To the dismay of the decision makers, they were asked to listen in silence and not to respond on the day. And they said, I'm looking at James here, and they said, you can't do that. They, we'll have to say something. And I said, no, you don't. No, you don't, because I need you to listen. And if you're busy thinking what you're going to respond, you can't listen. And, um, and off we went. And we asked people in local communities to talk about their lives, answering four questions. What's good about where you live? Most people like where they live. They want it to be better, but they like it. What's good about you, where you live? What's not so good? What are you doing already to make a difference? And this was a complete eye-opener to the decision makers. And what are your hopes and fears for the future? The people who took part in that listening exercise have never forgotten it. Richard Penn, who was then chief executive at Bradford, still uses that story when he meets people. It had a profound effect on the people who were making the strategic decisions. So when we'd done the report, one of the new things that came out of that report was local people saying about consultation and decision making. And when I stood back, and it was sort of my job to kind of think, where did we take this? It seemed to me to be really clear, top down and bottom up, lots of activity on the ground. Mark, we couldn't move for strategies in Bradford. Kirsten or England will tell you this, we had loads of strategies. And never the twain were meeting because there wasn't a means by which um, they could. And in 1995, we had the Bradford riots, which kind of um, didn't come as a surprise. And, that, and the commission into that made exactly the same point. So then began a journey to see if we could model in the voluntary sector what seemed to me to be needed to have to happen. How am I doing for time? Oh, lords. And it, it was kind of equal opportunities ask. We were going to ask local people to do something really strange. Most community activities ad hoc, it responds to need ad hoc. If you see a need or you're, you've got a need yourself, you'll often organise. And we were going to ask local people to get strategic. We invited public services to come and do some creative learning sessions with us about how they could be better partners with communities and inviting everybody, the whole system, to connect in new ways. And there was something very important we discovered for community cohesion. I'll come back to that. I'm skipping years now. This period of, of knowing there needed to be a ho the hole in the middle filled to it actually being mainstreamed by Bradford Council was a 14-year period of work in which various people employed me. And in all this, I was, my role was as catalyst and broker. It was on the estate. And that's what you are sitting here. You are all potential and probably actual people who are catalysts and brokers. You know this picture. You can bring the right people together. And so we developed in Bradford through the then Neighbourhood Renewal Funding, Neighbourhood Action Planning. By then we've got a local strategic partnership. I was appointed as Director of Neighbourhood Renewal. And God bless the leader, Margaret Eaton, she saw something in this and allowed us to have a chunk of money to work with 66 neighbourhoods across Bradford, self-defining um, action planning. And they had to come with a public sector partner or a voluntary and or voluntary sector partner. And what we built across those or what they built were local partnerships, a bit like that Homewood Council. There was a community dowry, a bit of money that the community had to put on the table along with the partners, and we had a similar process 
for communities of interest. Not everybody's story works out at a neighbourhood level. I want to get this last bit in because if we really want prosperous communities, we can do lots at the local level. And what frontliners and, and local people know is some very small adjustments, from very small actions can make a big difference. But actually, and this is, I'm looking right at James now, this is about a virtuous, a virtuous cycle here. If you have neighbourhoods thinking about what they can do for themselves, together with their partners, then actually it starts to give real intelligence to people who have strategic decisions to make. If you are looking at tackling hard issues from the strategic level, you're looking at it through it through a plethora of blooming planning groups. If you look at that same issue from a neighbourhood, it's much, much more clear. And, and I just wanted to say this. The state alone cannot and never has been able to do with people deliver people's needs. Austerity has just made that much clearer. It's true. So a bit of humility on the public services front. Politicians cannot make the best or bravest decisions if they don't know what policies and actions citizens will support. Citizens don't know what those are if they're not deliberating together. Public services can't meet the needs of people they serve without the resources that families and communities can bring. And we can't have a sensible agreement about what the state needs to provide if we've not already explored together what we can already do and what well-resourced families and communities can do and for those that are not well-resourced, what then needs to go in. This stuff can look soft. But I've been part of solving some very hard problems. This is not soft stuff to be ignored. This is soft stuff that actually allows us to tackle some really hard issues. And just when I thought I was okay sitting in my kitchen, not having to do any of this anymore, my own neighbourhood breaks out with blooming gang crime, violent crime, we've got child sexual exploitation going on in Keithley and hey ho, here we go again. And I'm delighted to say on Tuesday we have our visioning process for Imagine Keithley. And it was the police who said, if only we could create a kinder and more generous Keithley. And that's what I'm hoping we can do. Thank you. Am I okay on time? Absolutely.